I can't remember a time when I really liked myself. I can't remember a time where I didn't want to be a little bit different. I'd go to school and I wasn't accepted, I wasn't included, I wasn't very cute as a kid, and I wanted to be accepted, I wanted to be liked, I wanted to be included. I, you know, at worst, I wanted to be noticed. And so, I would look at the cool kid, the little popular little girl, and if Susie was noticed and Susie was liked, then I would look at Susie and say, what is it about her that um, I could emulate or I could imitate? And if Susie had a particular laugh, I laughed that way. If she wore a particular dress, I dressed that way. And the sad thing is, is that was kind of what defined my life. Um, in high school, I learned that I could win approval if I made great grades. I could win approval if I sang, I, um, I was musical. I could win approval if I became a good public speaker. I was still watching and observing people and I would become whatever they wanted to, me to be. Whatever I needed to be to win their approval, to be liked, to be included, that's what I became. And it kept on, it never stopped. As I became an adult, I would join boards and committees and striving, and now I'm climbing ladders. I'm climbing social ladders to be included, to be liked, to be um, admired. I'm climbing business ladders, you know, outsmarting people, outmaneuvering people, using people to get ahead. And so what I found is, by the time I was about 40 years old, I was where everybody wanted me to be. I climbed a social ladder. I was pretty high on a social ladder. I was pretty high. I had a job that other people respected and admired. I had political influence. I was on every board and volunteer community board you could imagine that the important people were on. I had a husband that was fabulous and people in the community loved him. He loved me. I had three great kids. I had absolutely everything the world said I needed and I was miserable inside. And if you needed me to be cute and funny and flirtatious for me to please you, that's what I became. If you needed me to be serious and logical and efficient, that's what I'd become. If the next person wanted me to be the life of the party, I was the life of the party. I could change disguises, change masks at the drop of a hat. I was a chameleon and I was miserable inside. At 40 years old, I had everything the world said I needed to be happy. I went to church. Heck, I've been to church more than most people. I sang in the choir, I've taught Sunday school. I was doing all the religious things, had the great job, had you know all the social climbing that I needed to have. Politically, I was on everything. And at 40 years old, I was absolutely drop dead, miserable inside. And I didn't know why. And I couldn't tell anybody because I had everything everybody said that I needed. And here, you know, I found myself in this crazy place where, you know, I was too ashamed and I was too um, proud to let on that things weren't okay. And I was the perpetual fine person. How you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I mean, I plastered a smile on my face and was still striving and driving and manipulating and conquering because I kept thinking if I can just climb that one more higher hill and get one more further ladder, maybe they'll like me, maybe they'll love me, maybe they'll accept me. You know, I gave up on trying to have friends. You know, everybody was my competitor. I didn't know how to be friends. I had no idea how to be friends. And so then I started thinking, okay, I'll just go for power. You know, maybe I'll get so powerful that they'll respect me. And it's just so sad because there's just this quivering little person in me that was just dying to be loved and to be liked and to be wanted and to be accepted. And it was my whole life, my whole life was a lie. And at 40 years old, my mother gave me a daily guidepost for Christmas. And it's one of those little books where you have the daily devotionals and you're just reading Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. And I started walking, you know, I'm set, I, I'm doing 30 minutes a day exercising all the time. I was an exercise freak and I'm walking now with my daily devotional. And I'd write down the little devotional on a three by five card and carry it with me. And I remember I'd start off, don't even know why, I'd say the Lord's Prayer and I would go, Our Father. And then I'd go, 
you know, I don't really feel like you're my father at all. I had a really good father, but I don't think you like me very much, God, and I don't think you're my father. And I would do the Lord's Prayer like that. I would do the 23rd Psalm like that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I'm like, I want a lot of things, Lord. And I flat out want a life that's decent because I don't have abundant life. You talk about abundant life, I don't have abundant life. Life sucks. I hate my life, I hate myself. And heck, I figure you hate me too. And I started doing those daily devotionals and talking them, just talking them through. Whatever the daily devotional was, I wrote it down a little three by five car and I took it with me on my 30 minute walk and I would talk and it would just be one little line. And it would be something God would be saying to me today. I'd do the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer every day and that little one line. And God was gradually telling me he loved me, even though I thought he was the big bad wolf waiting to zap my butt to hell. And I thought, what, hey, and I would talk to him. I was so honest. And I'm embarrassed to say I'd cuss at him. I would just yell at him. I would say, you know, God, why? Just why? Why can you love everyone else and not love me? You know, what did I do? Why can you forgive everybody else, but you can't forgive me? You know, I just, why can, why can everybody else seem to have something just have some kind of life. You talk about abundant life. Life is not abundant. Life is awful. And I had all these snakes in my head, way too much pride, way too much shame or guilt or something to tell anybody. And I had my little fine face on. I'm fine. I'm fine. And all the time I'm just dying inside. And um, one day, and I think it was like three months, I'd been doing those daily devotionals for three months. And one day I just said, God, I will do anything. I will do anything if you will just love me. I'll do anything. And I remember the funniest thing is I said, I'll do anything except turn into Jerry and John. Well, I had these two older brothers and they were these geeky Jesus freak brothers. And they had so embarrassed me all through my life. I mean, they were Bible toting, long stringy hair, stand on street corners preaching. And I remember saying, God, I'll do anything you want me to do, but don't turn me into Jerry and John. And it's really funny because God just waited. He just waited until I got a little more miserable, kept doing my daily devotionals, kept walking, kept talking to him until finally the day I just said, God, I'll do anything. I will do anything. Just please love me. Please forgive me. I really thought I'd, I really thought that I'd committed the unforgivable sin. So I was apologizing to everybody. I was writing letters going, you know, when I was in the 10th grade, I did something really ugly to you and I am so sorry. <laughs> I, mean, I know people thought I was crazy. I was apologizing right and left to people. And I'm um, just writing letters saying, you know, I remember a time when I hurt you, please forgive me. And I poured my soul out to God saying, God, I remember a time when I hurt this pe person. Is that, is that the sin? Is that the reason you can't forgive me? And I did that for months thinking it was a sin. It was some sin that was between me and God. One day, one day it got so, I don't know, so raw with God. And, you know, I said, God, I've, I have, I have, I've apologized to everybody I can think of. I just remember stopping and saying, Lord, I have screwed up this beautiful life that you've given me, and I am so profoundly sorry. And you know, I realized I'd apologize to everybody, but I'd never apologize to God. And for about 10 minutes, God gave me peace. For about 10 minutes, I didn't feel like God hated me and I hated myself. Now, after those 10 minutes, I finished the, finished the rest of the day with snakes in my head like I had spent my whole 40 years. Um, and then the next day, I did the same thing over and over. And for three weeks, I stayed kind of stuck in that little place of God would give me a few minutes of peace. And then I'd spend 24 hours in hell. 
until God gave me a verse, and it was Ephesians 2, 8. And Ephesians 2, 8 says, grace, salvation, is a gift. And you have to faith it to receive it. You know, that's not word for word, but that's what it said to me. It's a gift, and you have to faith it to receive it. And I thought, oh my gosh, God, you want me to believe that I'm saved. You know, I'd said all the words, and I really believed it. I believed Jesus died for my sins. I believed that God said he'd forgiven me, but I couldn't hang on to it. I couldn't grasp it. And I thought, you know what, God, you're telling me just, just faith it. Just grab it. Ugh. I grabbed on to the belief that God was who he said he was, my good heavenly father that loved me. I grabbed on to the belief that I was his child, that I was forgiven, that he didn't condemn me anymore, that he didn't hate my guts, um, that he wasn't gonna zap my butt to hell. Um, I had to faith that God said who he said he was, and then I had to faith that I was saved and forgiven. And that was hard. I'd spent 40 years with lies in my head, with snakes in my head. It was hard believing um, what God said about me. I probably stayed seesawing like that, faithing, doubting, faithing, doubting. I was so susceptible to lies, lies I'd told myself. You know, somebody would look at me funny and I would just be taken straight down into not believing I was loved, not believing I was a child of God. God tucked me into a cocoon. I call it my little cocoon period. For two years, I stayed in a cocoon. I was soaking up the Word of God. I stopped doubting God. I doubted Him my whole life. It had gotten me nowhere. You know, virgin birth, hey, creation story, yeah, well. Yeah, I didn't believe all that stuff before. Now, phew, I wasn't gonna doubt it. Just because it wasn't logical, who was I? My brain size of a Coke can against God's brain, I wasn't gonna doubt. I willed myself to not doubt. I believed, I faithed that God was true and that what God says was the truth. For two years, I soaked it up. I was soaking up scripture, I was soaking up God's love, but I was still wearing the masks. I was still wearing disguises. I was still going out, being whatever you needed me to be, still climbing, still manipulating, still, you know, not understanding how to have relationships with other people. But I stayed in my little cocoon. About two years after that first walk, where God literally changed my life. Two years in a cocoon, one day God whispered to me and said, Virginia, we're gonna go out today naked and unashamed. I remember the voice, naked and unashamed. I'm like, what are you talking about, God? He goes, we're gonna go out without a disguise, no masks. We're gonna let the world see who you are. I didn't know who I was. <laughs> I had worn disguises for so long, I had no idea. I don't know if you remember that story, um, the runaway bride, she had liked eggs. Julia Roberts had liked all these different kind of eggs and finally Richard Guerra turns her and says, what kind of eggs do you like? She didn't know. You know, she just became whatever that person wanted to become. That's who I was. I had become what other people wanted me to be or what I thought they wanted me to be, to be included, to be liked, to be accepted, to be noticed. You know, I didn't have any idea who I was. And God says, we're going to go out, just you and me. And I was like, heck no, God. I don't even know who I am. C.S. Lewis had this line that says, the more, the more you become like Christ, the more you take on the personality God created you to be. You know, I grabbed that. He might not be scripture, but I love C.S. Lewis. And I grabbed that thinking, you know, who am I, God? I don't know who I am. And he just kind of whispered, well, we're going to go and, and I'm going to show you who you are. And I used to call them trigger people in trigger places. And they were the, pl the places during that two-year period where I recognized they gave me the yips. 
I mean, I'd get in those, those places or around those people and all of my feelings of insecurity and low self-esteem and not being good enough and not being accepted, it was like they would just be magnified a thousand times. And here I am, God whispering that we're going to go out naked and unashamed. And you know what my greatest fear was? My greatest fear was that someone that I considered important, significant to me, was going to say, I see the real you now, and I don't like that one either. <laughs> so that first day, I'm walking down the hall at work, and I see this girl coming, and she's one of my trigger people. And normally I would have ducked in a hall now in this two-year period. And I'm like, God, I can't do this. And he's going, sure you can. I'm going, God, I can't do it. And he goes, you can do this. And I remember as clearly as a bell going, Jesus, you do it. I'm not doing it. And I was praying, what do you want me to say, Jesus? What do you want me to say? What do I do? What do I do? I don't know what to say. Jesus, tell me what to say. And I kept praying, show me, Jesus, how do I love her? How do I love her like you? How do I love her? And he whispered, ask about her children. <laughs> and I met her in the hall. And it was a long haul. Had a long prayer time preparing for her. And I remember looking at her face going, Susan, how are your kids? You look a little sad. And she looked at me and she said, Virginia, that's interesting that you ask. My child's home today sick and I'm having to work and I absolutely hate it. I just hate it that I'm not home with her. And I walked away and the most amazing things happened. See, every other time I'd walked away from Susan, I'd be wondering, what does she think about me? Did she think I was clever? Did she think I was smart? It's kind of like I gave, gave myself a grade. You know, did I, did I take another rung on the ladder? Did I rise a little on that ladder? Or did I say something stupid so now she thinks I'm dumb? You know, it was always about me. What did they think about me? Well, here I'm walking away from her. And I remember thinking, I'm not thinking about me. <laughs> And I remember hearing Jesus go, good job, you did good. You loved her like I would love her. That was a major day for me. I went home that night and instead of giving myself a grade when I went to bed, kind of rehashing the day going, did they think I was smart? Did they think I was clever? Did I climb any rungs? You know, how did I do? I didn't have, I didn't beat myself up. Um, I wasn't even thinking about me. God was saying, that was a good day. That was a good day. That's how I learned to walk. That's how I learned how to walk out with God. I learned that secret that Paul said, it's Christ in you. I learned the value of letting God in His Word tell me who I was. Yeah, I didn't know who I was. Before I started reading the Bible, I thought I was a scum. I thought I was lowering the fish feces. You know, I had no idea. I did not know that God was my Heavenly Father that adored me. I thought He was the big bad wolf waiting to zap me to hell. Um, I had to read the Bible. I had to find out who God was. I had to find out, I had to let Him tell me who I was, and then I had to let him remake me and show me that there's only one way to go out in that world, and it's to take Jesus with you. And it's not about me, Virginia, meeting people. It's about Jesus jumping in my skin and saying, Jesus, how do you want to love them? What do you want to say to them? You know, what do you want me to do with my hands and with my feet and, and with my heart? And when I'm too scared, I just go, Jesus, you do it for me. Which is in fact what he really wants to do all along is he wants to do it for us. He wants to walk again. And I had to learn that. Gradually, about 12 years later now, I am living abundantly. I know what it means to, to fly free in Christ. You know, my passion, 
my absolute passion in life is to help other people that I see being bound by low self-esteem, by some, some sort of brokenness, whatever it is, if it's guilt, if it's fear, if it's, if it's manipulation, if people abused you, if you're, you know, I, my passion is to help people find what I found in Christ. And it starts with knowing who God is. You gotta be in His Word. You gotta be talking. You know, I'm cussing at God. You know, nobody knew. Nobody knew. And I'm pouring out my heart and saying, God, please love me. I had no idea He loved me. God, don't hate me. God, please forgive me. I had no idea He was just waiting to forgive me. All He wanted me to do was give myself to Him. So now, I've jumped in the deep end with Jesus Christ. I will never forget what hell felt like. I lived with it in my head all day long for 40 years. I don't want to go back there. And I don't not only, want, not only do I not want to go back there, I want to help every person I can find what I found, that God is a really, really good, loving God, that He has a beautiful life for you, that He has a purpose that's beyond any kind of hill you can climb, whether it's social, whether it's business, whether it's, it doesn't matter, that what God has planned for you is the absolute best life ever. And there is nothing this world can offer you that's going to take that away. Part of my healing, part of the process of the healing, um, after I got through it, looking back, I realized there were about, there were three things that were hugely important. Some other things that were lesser important, being in God's Word, actually being in the Bible, reading those daily devotionals, God was dropping line by line by line His heart into my mind. And what He was doing, because I was a child of God, is the Holy Spirit was literally teaching now my spirit, what God thought, what God, what, what God thought about me, what I was to think about God. So reading God's Word was hugely important. Second thing, I think, was prayer. You know, I'm, I'm on a walk 30 minutes a day, and I'm just talking to God. And I am talking to God so, there's no these and those and oh my father and all that holier than thou verbiage. Oh, nah, -uh. I'm like, I am so honest with God and I am, I am telling him exactly how I was feeling and I am asking him questions. And the craziest thing about reading scripture the way I did, by taking that one little line, that one little line that he gave me a day and talking through it, I would be asking him questions going, you know, what does this word mean? What does that mean when it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want? I'm like, Lord, I got lots of wants. You know, what does that mean? And I would, I would take it apart word by word and say, shepherd, you know, what did a shepherd do for his sheep? You know, a shepherd was guarding them, protecting them. A, she a shepherd would, you know, heal them up and put medicine on their wounds. And a shepherd would fight the bad guys. And I would go, God, do you do that for me? You know, do you do that for me? And I was honestly asking questions and letting the Holy Spirit drop thoughts in my mind. And all of a sudden I would have something come to my mind and it wouldn't be me. It'd be a thought I'd never thought before. And it would be a God thought, a, a holy thought, and a thought about hope, and a thought about God's goodness. And I realized that's how the Holy Spirit was teaching me. But boy, was I brutally honest. You know, I didn't mince words with God. If, if, if I didn't feel good about something, I told Him. But I gave God time to, to talk to me, and I listened. So being in the Word, being honest with God. And I had one friend. His name was Lawrence, and Lawrence told me every day how much Jesus loved me. Every day. You know, Lawrence was a crazy guy, but Lawrence told me. Here I am not even revealing my heart and my struggle to Tim, who's my husband, and I couldn't reveal my heart and my soul to just all those people out there that I was ashamed of or afraid of or scared to show the real me to, but I had one person, and that one person, all they said was, God loves you. God's forgiven you. Don't be so hard on yourself. Quit beating yourself up. Just know Jesus loves you. Being in the Word, talking to the Holy Spirit, praying to God, 
and having one person in my court telling me how much God loved me, it meant the world, it meant the world to me. So now, I want to be that Lawrence. I want to be that person that stands in someone else's court and tries to get them in the Word, tries to get them talking honestly to God, tries to get them um, relying on Jesus when they get into circumstances that, that they can't handle. And I have to tell you, all of life is a circumstance we can't handle. You know, we're not supposed to be doing life on our own. It's supposed to be our weakness and His strength. You know, a million times, watch Joshua, he goes into battle and God's saying, be strong and courageous. The word strong, he's saying, grab hold of me. You know, one of the hardest things you do when you're broken is grab hold of God. We're, we're, we've got such a weak grip. So, I want to help people. I want to be a Lawrence to them. I want to teach them who God is. I want to get them in the Word. I want to get them praying. I want to get them talking honestly with the Holy Spirit. And I want to keep reminding them over and over and over. Secret, your weakness plus God's strength. Grab hold of God and He's not going to let you down. And He is going to take you to a path of freedom and a path of abundant life.